I'm uh, Nick Chaudhry, co-founder, uh, COO, CTO at Buzz. Um, as Jim was describing, we have this platform called Power AI. And what, what it does is basically we are doing grid inspections. And as we all know, grid infrastructure is failing. It's outdated. A lot of problems are happening, especially we see the utilities like pg and &E, SoCal Edison, the infrastructure is causing a lot of damage and disasters such as wildfires. I'll highlight that, but before jumping into that, uh, just wanted to highlight what, what is Bus Solutions? How did we launch? Uh, so we are we launched out of Stanford University in 2017. I'm part of the uh, CE program, Atmosphere Energy. Um, I met my co-founder over here in 2017. We decided to uh, incorporate the company, uh, commercialize the product that we were developing. And then we spent two years deploying the technology, uh, working on our models, um, developing the technology. And then we got funded by venture capitalists uh, in Silicon Valley uh, that believed in the vision of infrastructure can be improved. There could be technology that can help power utilities uh, make their processes more efficient because uh, we all know they are, they really need that. But we were featured in, uh, you know, uh, power grid major utilities uh, publications, TND World, Energy Central, uh, Wall Street Journal, Forbes. Uh, but our main vision is, and our main mission is to revolutionize and, and disrupt this industry, which is facing a lot of problems uh, that's impacting society. And speaking of the biggest problem, as we all know, uh, wildfires, they're becoming a new norm. Fire season is, is a phrase that's become pretty common, which is sad. But one of the reasons why, why wildfires are happening as we all know, is failed grid infrastructure. Um, here are some of the statistics. Camp Fire, which was one of the biggest fire in the history of this uh, country, was caused by broken sea hooks. And sea hooks are basically uh, joints that uh, hold the insulators together on these high transmission lines. Before I jump into that, uh, I've said the phrase transmission. I believe people are aware of transmission distribution, substation, raise of hands who, are, who have a background in power systems, energy, so I'll, I'll try to keep uh, the conversation away from a lot of power systems lingo. Uh, but yeah, transmission uh, lines are high voltage lines. We're talking about 250,000 volts. Distribution is low voltage. Uh, so yeah, so campfire was caused by these sea hooks that were broken and that led to $9 billion in losses, 85 dead. Uh, PG&E in, in 2018, they had already identified 146 structures that needed replaced. Uh, replacement, but they were not able to get to maintenance and repair faster. Uh, 3,700 unanswered maintenance requests in 2018 uh, before the major fires happened. And because of that, the, the fires happened. And again, uh, another big fire camp, Wolsey Fire produced you know, 5.5 million tons of carbon dioxide. So that has a big impact on the carbon emission as well. So this is a big problem that we're trying to solve. And what, what's happening is now utilities are on their feet. They are capturing a lot of data out in the field. So they're flying drones, they're flying helicopters around these lines uh, to capture the data. For example, pg &E captures 5 million images. Uh, now they're capturing 10 million images on an annual basis. But what the problem is that these utilities have uh, you know, incorporated drone programs, they, they have helicopters, they have ground vehicles, and they're capturing so much visual data. The problem still remains is once that data comes back to them, uh, it takes months of manual analysis time in order to make sense out of it and then send out repair replacement. And the problem is during that time frame, uh, things like you know uh, camp, uh, campfire happens, things like uh, uh, you know the, uh, the the infrastructure damages, and that leads to another wildfire situation. So what we're trying to do over here is trying to solve that. So first of all, it's a slow process. You know, millions of visual data points coming back for a single utility it takes months of manual analysis time, unscalable. So at that level of data that's coming back to them, uh, it becomes manually impossible to kind of go through every single image and make sense out of it. And then because of that delay, there's high risk. So the sector is losing $170 billion due to power outages, blackouts, force shutdowns, mass disasters. That's where we are coming in uh, with our solution again, Power AI. Uh, we wanted to name it Power I, but stuck with Power AI. Uh, basically does, 
data management, visual inspections, anomaly detection, analytics, a lot of heavy words, but I'll get into those, what that means. So first of all, we start with data management. Millions of data points coming back to pg &E. They don't know where to store this data. It's just sitting on hard drives. We have even seen utilities use VHS tapes, which is just <laughs> mind boggling. Um, they send those VHS tapes to us. We don't know how to you know, make sense out of it. But what we're trying to do is bring technology to them. We're trying to bring cloud uh, and secure cloud to them, cloud storage, cloud data management. And that's one of the functions of our platform. The second is once that data is managed in one single location, now they know, you know where this data is coming from, where are these regions. A lot of these regions are in remote areas and they don't even know how to access those. Uh, so we do asset tracking, uh, which is mapping out all different structures. So all the poles, all the, uh, track, all the towers uh, out in the field to the centimeter level accuracy. So now they know where their assets, electrical components are located. And then moving on, once the assets are, you know, uh, they're mapped, we, we go into the actual AI, which is our proprietary models called uh, uh, they, that are based on computer vision technology, what they do is they process this data. So they will churn all of this imagery through, through, the, through the models, make sense out of it. And by sense, I mean, they'll detect whether the insulator is damaged, whether the conductor is damaged, whether there's overheating in the line uh, and generate all these results back for the utilities. And then the last step is sending all these results to the utilities in a prioritized manner. Because uh, we don't want all these results to be sitting on a server and you know, no one actually going out in the field and doing repair and replacement. We want, it to, uh, we want to send that to the work order system. And what that does, or what we do for them with that system is we prioritize. And what I mean by prioritize is some faults are emergency, like the sea hooks damage that we saw right now that caused a major wildfire. That's an emergency kind of situation. Go out in the field, repair that as soon as possible. Versus, oh, we have some rusting happening. It's still not that bad of a deal. You'll touch that in six months. So prioritization is a, is a big factor to save time. To, uh, to describe the, the process that we do, uh, again, in a flowchart kind of way. So aerial data is being captured by drones, helicopters, millions of images on an annual basis. Comes back to us, we ingest that data scalably process it, the ad predictions are reviewed with a tool called Human in the Loop, which I'll get into it uh, in the later slides. Uh, we track feedback from subject matter experts. Again, our team is very technology focused. We have power systems background, but we're talking about linemen, field technicians, people who are out in the field doing, uh, looking at these assets. They have you know, decades of experience, taking their feedback to make the models more better, more personalized, more robust. Uh, visualization and analytics, uh, so showing it in neat format so that the stakeholders can actually understand where the problems are happening. Reporting, so generating inspection reports uh, so that they can, they can be uh, you know, uh, prioritized based on work order tickets. And the last step is work order tickets. So getting a ticket, with me, which means, okay, insulator X is damaged in certain area Y, go out in the field, do repair right now. Now getting into the, the technicalities of the algorithms we have, uh, again, our whole technology is based on proprietary computer vision, machine vision models. So a lot of machine learning AI <coughs> uh, systems that we have deployed. So the kind of algorithms we are using uh, is, is, I don't wanna get in too much detail because uh, that's a computer science topic, but image clustering, uh, by image cl clustering, what we mean is, let's say a drone goes out in the field there's a wooden pole or city line pole. Uh, they collect 10, 15 images around it. That those come back to us and then they do it for 30,000 poles. So we have a lot of images coming to us and we want to cluster them to the specific poles. And that's what the clustering algorithm does is it uses geospatial or GPS information and it clusters it together. Segmentation, uh, what we use segmentation for is that the computer vision model uh, basically looks at areas where there is greenery or dry bush, and that is mainly used for vegetation encroachment, which is a big problem, again, for one fire purposes, fire hazard. So let's say three branches on the line, that's a fire hazard situation. So we segment out those portions using uh, computer vision because uh, the machine sees that certain specific pattern in the, in the greenery or dry bush and segments it out from the power line or other uh, you know, objects in the image. And, and then senses out well, how far is this, is this branch from the power line. And then lastly, anomaly detection, and this is mainly for electrical components. 
So let's say the insulators, uh, detecting insulators, detecting conductors, uh, other kinds of electrical components and the damages on them. And how we do that is, you know, we have used, uh, I, I said, we started commercially deploying in 2019 and we're still training the models continuously and that's the power of uh, machine learning is that it learns, but we have to, you know, uh, get a lot of training data. And by training data, this is all proprietary images that are out in the field that utilities don't really share with anyone. So we had to go out and partner with them. And now we have, I would say over 100,000 images of visual data points that are training data for us. So we, we take them, we store them, and then we label them. So we manually have to label thousands, tens of thousands of images, uh, go through them, you know, draw boxes around them, as you can see over here, uh, that's called a bounding box annotation. And then once that is done, send it back to our systems, our algorithms that do pre-processing of that imagery. So adjust the brightness, adjust the blurriness, those kind of things. Uh, and then lastly is using that imagery, using that those guidelines, we teach the machine to kind of learn from it, just like a human being would learn like a five-year-old. Okay, this is an apple with green color or a branch. It learns uh, what does an insulator look like? Uh, what are the specific characteristics of an insulator? What is the specific characteristic of a power line? Uh, and then it learns over time. And then we deploy it. Uh, model deployment is a big factor at scale. We're talking about millions of images coming on a regular basis into our system. So we want to keep the system heavy, robust, and secure. So that's a big factor. Model monitoring, how the model is performing. So penalize it where it's you know, making mistakes and then reward it where it's doing good. So just like a feedback system. Active learning, which I'll get into that in the next few slides. And then model branching. So that is something that we stole from tech companies like Facebook and Instagram, because uh, we, we got to know through our colleagues what kind of systems they are using, which they shouldn't have discussed, but they did. Uh, <laughs> I will name my friends. But uh, so basically what they do is uh, they map customer profiles uh, using a branch and trunk model kind of uh, system. And what that means is that there is a trunk and there's branches coming out of it and each branch represents a model for a customer. So Instagram will have uh, just like my profile, they have a trunk model that gets trained on a, you know, let's say every two months, but they have a branch model coming out that represents me as a, as a customer that gets trained on a regular basis. For Instagram, it's hourly, for us, it's weekly. So that brings in the personalization effect. To highlight some examples, uh, what we see is, I, I named a lot of electrical components, insulators, conductors, those kind of things, and what they look like. So I'll start off with these two things. These are dampers. Uh, what they do is they absorb vibrations in the power line as you know, this uh, electromagnetic uh, energy in the power lines, high voltage power lines, they, they vibrate. And these are the ones that stop those vibrations so that they don't interact with each other. So this is what it looks like when it's damaged. And when it's damaged, what happens is that they start vibrating again and they can crash. Uh, another example, this is from a helicopter. Again, very zoomed out image. One of the things that we have to battle in terms of challenges is we don't have any standardization in like image capture. So we'll get pretty zoomed in images and then we'll get this. So uh, we had to train the models to actually identify what is a good image versus what is, you know, an image from, from a bad angle. Um, so, so this is, uh, we still do high accuracy results on this, uh, on this one. And then we see images like this, which is super zoomed out. But what we were looking for in this image was vegetation. So as you can see, there's a, there's a line and there's a heavy vegetation. So our systems are able to uh, kind of detect that as well. And the last four ones are insulators um, uh, that are damaged as, as you can see clearly and our systems are able to detect them. And then before I get into that, I've named insulators a lot. One of the purposes of insulators is to separate out the high voltage lines. So as you can see, transmission lines have longer insulators and you'll see distribution ones, which are in the voltage you have smaller insulators. The next process is, is called human in the loop. And this is a tool that was uh, kind of an idea given to us by uh, one of our customers because they got really scared when we approached them uh, and we said that, hey, we have AI and then they're like, just hold on over here. Are you, are you here to take our jobs? Mm -hmm. And we said, no, we'll be trying to work with you. This is another you know, tool in your tool shed. Uh, and they said that we want to be included. These are linemen who have experience of like 30 years in the field. They go out in the field with their binoculars, look at the lines every single day, take notes. 
And we said that, hey, we, we want to help you. We want to make your lives much more easier. Um, so we introduced this, this service or tool in our platform. And what it does is that the AI does predictions and it generates recommendations like this. This is a chip insulator over here. It's broken. Uh, what it does is now the linemen or the field technician or engineers can go into the, into the platform and then they can provide their feedback. Again, we don't say that our AI is 100% accurate because no AI is 100% accurate. Um, that's where the subject matter expert feedback comes in. And this is something uh, analogous to the healthcare sector. If you see, there's a lot of uh, you know, subject matter expertise going on in the healthcare sector as well, especially for lung x-ray scans. You have surgeons that are looking and providing the feedback for the AI to learn more. We kind of replicated that over here. And what it does is that all that feedback goes to a backend system, and then we, we retrain the AI continuously. We take that feedback, and then we make an action out of it. And that system is called active learning. So it's continuously learning from humans, and then providing that uh, value to humans back. Uh, that brings in the personalization that, brings, that makes the AI faster. Just for statistics or, uh, or numbers, using this system, we have seen a ramp up of accuracy from a 65% to 95% within three weeks. And the last, last thing is, uh, you know, we want to make sense out of these uh, results. We don't want them to be sitting on, on a software or a server. Uh, so what, what we do is we generate reports for people who don't understand technology. And we're talking about some of the people in, in the utility space, which honestly, we, we just had an uh, interaction with, with someone who was still using Windows 7. So we want to make it easier for them to understand what, what this is. So we, we make reports uh, ingestible for people who are you know, electrical engineers who don't have a back, background in software or AI. And we generate reports in, in dashboards that are easy to kind of ingest. And then we can export it out in the form of PDF, uh, inspection reports, or CSV spreadsheets. And all of those goes, uh, go to work order systems. Uh, so what a work order system is, uh, for a utility, they get various kind of work order requests. And what, what that means is, okay, insulator Y is damaged in the location, uh, prioritize that and go out and <clears throat> do maintenance and repair. Uh, that's the whole purpose of the system. So we, we take that, imagine them getting 10,000 requests on a single day, and these are just one single field technician. It becomes impossible for them to go out and the field and repair. Uh, we take that portion from them. We use AI and machine learning to prioritize various kinds of faults for them so that they now know which top 10 ones they have to go out in the field and the next ones they can you know, tackle in the next few days. And we also integrate with geospatial systems. So ESRI is our GIS to kind of overlay the data so they know where these, loca uh, where these locations are. So that was mainly for power lines. Uh, so transmission line, distribution line, uh, the, that's more like linear infrastructure. Uh, now we are also deploying our products for substations too. So that's a new product that has come to us, new use case. And what really happens at substations is there is a lot of theft, there is a lot of intrusion, uh, a lot. And this would be surprising because this was surprising for me. Also, people go into substations and and steal copper rings that are sold at very high price. Uh, people have told us that people have gotten, a lot of people have gotten electrocuted doing that. Uh, so detecting person, uh, detecting people that are injured at substations, if they were able to intrude and were trying to steal and they got electrocuted. So these substations are heavy, uh, you know, voltage substations, transformers, high energy uh, environments. So what we did was we wanted to bring in the power of surveillance into this uh, and how we did it. Substations have uh, cameras deployed over there. We deployed an AI system on top of the cameras uh, to just do 24 seven surveillance. So uh, looking at people that are authorized to come into the substation. So intrusion detect uh, detection surveillance, uh, heat events, seeing if there's smoke or fire, those kind of events starting to happen. Uh, so using thermal imagery for that. Um, I have an example I'll show later. Uh, detecting thermal heat signatures on, on these substation assets in uh, transformers, uh, reactors, you know, you know all, those, all those electrical components, and then damages to them. So if there is a damage uh, to an electrical component or if there's uh, injured personnel out in the field lying down, detecting that uh, as well. And then logging all these anomalies and then sending out alerts uh, specifically to personnel so that they can, they can take some action out in the field. 
And this is a, these are a few examples of what it looks like. So we have you know, two, two cameras deployed at a substation. One does visible, one does thermal infrared. So visible is looking at you know, if there's physical damage on, on the insulators or conductors, as you can see, or if there's rusting, those kind of problems. And then what the thermal does, it looks at heat signatures. If any component is overheating beyond, uh, beyond its threshold, say, send an alert accordingly. And then again, it goes back to the alerting system and action has been taken. So all in all, what we are trying to do is we're just trying to make the operations and processes of utilities much more efficient. Utilities uh, are still very backward in terms of technology adoption. Uh, mm -hmm. We have talked to utilities that have sent us VHS tapes, as I described. We have talked to utilities that have people going out every day in the field, uh, walking down the line uh, with a binocular looking up and taking notes. Uh, we have seen people tell us that uh, the utilities uh, infrastructure is being shot down by, and that happened in Southern Texas, uh, is being shot down just for target, uh, you know, uh, just as a target practice. So these are the things that we're trying to uh, get away from with the power of, uh, you know, remote sensing, with the power of drones and, and machine learning. So making everything faster, making everything much more efficient, making everything much more accurate. Uh, imagine you are an engineer sitting on the computer, you get uh, a supply of uh, 15,000 images every day, and you have to go through them every single day, look at them, and, and it, it's just, it's not a good job to do. So make, taking that away from them and having them repurpose to the things that they're supposed to do, which is repair replacements, because these are electrical engineers, they're not supposed to be you know, looking at images eight hours a day. So making that process more accurate, then doing it you know, inexpensively, again, we are automated system, uh, that's the power of AI. Uh, you know, uh, on an average, we have a lineman shortage right now in the country. And uh, if we compare that with uh, the salary of a lineman right now is $250 an hour with our AI that drops down to $3 an hour. So there's a huge um, you know, incentive for utilities to adopt this. And then actionable. So again, we don't want all these results to be sitting down in a server. We want them to become actions so that people can go out in the field uh, do repair replacement in time so that disasters will happen. Uh, so just wanted to highlight some of the projects uh, that we have done and we're continuously working with utilities. Uh, one of the utilities we worked with uh, and are working with is Newfoundland Power and they are based in Canada. So they get extreme uh, snow storms uh, in the winters They're in the province of Newfoundland. Uh, they have uh, say five to six months of heavy snow. They said that they get six feet of snow at the peak season. So we have a lot of problems that happen on the infrastructure. And what we did was we just uh, deployed the system for them. And we analyzed 5,000 distribution poles, 500 transmission structures for them, around 45,000 images, found out heavy hotspot areas where problems are happening, uh, implemented the human in the loop workflow. And this is where we saw the accuracy jump from 65% to 95% in, within three, month, uh, three weeks. Uh, with their people, we have 25 inspectors, nine main fuel technicians on our platform continuously, and are still using it. And then uh, providing asset tracking capabilities, and this was a big one for them. So when we started working with their team, uh, we got a spreadsheet uh, full of poll numbers and their GPS coordinates. And then when our drone team, which is a drone partner up in Canada, uh, they went out in the field, they said that there is no poll over there. So half of them, were off by miles. Uh, so that whole sheet was outdated. The GPS coordinates were long gone. Um, so they had to you know, drive a lot. And we saved them a lot of time by updating all of that. And we got to know that sheet was updated 15 years ago. Uh, so so we, we did the update and now it's uh, continuously getting updated, uh, which is a big uh, you know, advantage for them. Another uh, big utility we are working with is National Grid. They are in the New England area. And what we did was for, for their distribution poles, uh, as you can see, here are some of the examples, finding out <clears throat> anomalies uh, on insulators, conductors, wooden poles, any kind of rust kind of problem. Uh, we, were, we are primarily working with the helicopter team. So they're trying to get more uh, better uh, high resolution, high zoom cameras uh, in, their, in their vehicles. Um, but that's another area that is getting a lot of technology infusion. And a lot of utility teams are adopting drones. Drones are becoming much more commoditized. They're cheaper, they're smaller. Why would someone fly a helicopter with the risk of crashing in a line and causing uh, 
uh, a lot of problems. Uh, and for a statistic, there are uh, around six to seven helicopter crashes every year. And, and it's, well, I would say fifth uh, most deadliest kind of job to do uh, as, a, as a lineman. Another utility, Amrin, they're based in uh, the Midwest. Um, they collect around a million. Now they're doing two million images every year. Uh, we analyzed around 2,000 transmission structures for them, uh, detected around 3,500 anomalies. And here are a few examples. These are all insulator damaged. So you can see this, these are heavily damaged insulators. Uh, and these are uh, these can cause sparking in the line. And again, there's dry you know, vegetation around it. That's another big problem. Uh, but sparking causes the line to go down, power outage, any kind of blackout. And whenever there is a blackout at a high transmission or high voltage line, everything downhill goes, goes bad also, and utilities lose a lot of money. So we're trying to prevent that as well. And then going to more substation use cases, this is another uh, team in, in the UK. Uh, they were walking around the substation with their DSLR camera, cameras around, uh, and what they were trying to detect was, was damages on their structures. So as you can see, there are concrete footings that are damaged, cracks happening. Uh, what that can lead to is, is just a whole structure getting uh, falling down and causing a lot of damage. So we detected that with our AI as well. Another big one, uh, this is New York Power Authority. Uh, they are the biggest state utility in the country and we're working with them. Uh, their plan is to become fully digital by 2030. Uh, I would say it's a pretty aggressive plan, but, but we're trying to help them with that. Uh, so infuse a lot of software, a lot of AI machine learning uh, into their systems. And this is actually what, what we do. We have deployed our software AI on the cameras at substations and continuously detecting the health of the electrical components. <clears throat> then we have the thermal. Uh, so this is also part of uh, you know, substation looking at the heat signature uh, whenever there is a high heat event, uh, detecting that early on and uh, causing uh, and, and monitoring that and sending out reports or alerts accordingly. And then we have uh this so we have a system already deployed at a substation as you can see this is a video from one of the live feeds and this is ai running already running on top of the video so we're getting 24 7 video uh this is a lower frame so that you see some lag uh but basically what it's doing is it's running on top and detecting any kind of damaged components uh as you can see it's mainly looking at insulators right now but there's other components also so we have two video feeds that are coming to us. One is in this format, which is visible spectrum. And then the other one is uh, the thermal, which was the one before the image. Uh, so that's detecting the heat signatures. Uh, should we take questions? Uh, I was trying to That's all I had. And uh, thank you. So anyone who's interested in being part of the mission. Yeah. Like I can be wrong, but in the introduction, I read that you have mastered in Stanford University about the energy engineering. But what led you up to while being the energy engineer, but what led you up to more fo be focused on machine learning and stuff? Yeah, so so I was in bronze for that for, for some time. They were using a lot of tools uh, on machine learning. So I got involved in a project where we bought a drone and we were trying to fly that. Uh, I went with Dan over here to a site in Half Moon Bay and testing out some drones. Uh, so how it started was, uh, I don't come from a software background. So my background is in civil and environmental engineering. Uh, and then I took a lot of courses at Stanford, obviously, like everyone else who does machine learning, two to nine, and doing those conventional uh, courses. But what the, the vision was to apply that kind of technology to the energy sector, because uh, that was the turning point. We wanted to bring a lot more emerging technologies into this, into this field. Um, and it was through projects I got involved. So initially, before Buzz became on the power lines, we were trying to do wind turbine inspections with drones. So another application of computer vision. So wind turbines get a lot of damage from, from again, high winds and structural damages. So we were trying to do that. And a history of Buzz is that I took a course called, uh, uh, it's Entre Entrepreneurship in Civil Environmental Engineering. And that's where I met my co-founder. I think it's called something else now, uh, but this is a launchpad course. So in my final quarter, 
uh, at Stanford, I took that course. Uh, we had this idea of using drones for wind turbines, building some machine learning models, uh, took some courses, wanted to try out my hand uh, at deploying them. Uh, but soon after the course, we realized we, we wanted to, again, incorporate and make this commercial. But once we started talking to utilities, uh, we talked to around 35, 37 utilities, and all of them had the same narrative that, uh, why don't you apply this technology for power lines? Because we are facing a lot of problems over here. It's a much bigger market. And this is before the wildfire started. So they knew something was going to happen and they just didn't have the resources to actually mitigate that. So they kind of gave us the hint and some of the big California utilities actually told us that, and why don't you apply this technology to the power sector and you know uh, use that? So that's when we pivoted. Uh, we didn't do wind turbine inspections. We focused on power lines. Uh, but but it was mainly through through projects and then I took courses at Stanford and then I wanted to apply that in the in industry uh, and deploy products uh, at scale. Thank you so much for the presentation. I can actually relate a lot. I'm also had a background in civil, but I've done damage inspection using computer vision in railways in Japan. And I wanted to understand more of the model that you guys do. I guess the problem is multi class classification. And so far, I heard you talk about power lines, radar branch, dampers, but how many objects or how many classes are you guys working with? Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with the classes. So we have, I would say 30 major ones that cover transmission, distribution, and substations. So we're talking about transformers, uh, reactors, insulators, dampers, as you saw, conductors, which are the actual lines. Um, then the structural damages, if there's wooden pole damage, Rot on the wood, wooden pole, cracks, uh, then rust, corrosion, and then vegetation, obviously. So we have around 30, and we're continuously increasing as we get more and more data. And the challenging part of this field is that every utility have their own inspection kind of criteria routine. And for example, a utility in California would have uh, uh, a priority for vegetation because they have fire hazard situations versus a utility in New York they have a lot of like snowstorms, so corrosion rust, rusting problem is, is big for them. Uh, so we have to cater to every single one, and that requires a start of time working with the utility, customizing the solutions, making them more personalized towards a specific utility. So that's one of the challenges that we have to work with. Uh, but we are seeing much more standard standardization happen, uh, much more you know uh, regulations being followed by utilities in terms of taxonomy guidelines. And yes, it, it's a multi-class classification problem. Uh, we do object anomaly detection. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't use off-the-shelf models because we tried that our vision API, uh, vision API from Google, recognition from AWS, they don't really work in this space. That's why we don't see Google uh, being the next utility big company. Uh, they've tried it out, it, it, it just doesn't work. So we had to build our own models, even though we have a backbone of conventional, you know, ResNet yeah. and yeah. Uh, those kind of, but we have our own layers and we have our own processes. So. And that's why I didn't go in depth over there because it's kind of a trade secret for us and proprietariness is the way how we label the images is different from everything else. The way we pre-process the image is totally different. Uh, then the way we train the models, the way we layer the models is, is totally different. Uh, but yeah, but at the end of the day, we do the con convolution in the networks. So, and just a follow up, uh, you mentioned, I mean, in the slides, you mentioned all the images were bounding box, but you're actually doing segmentation, right? So pixel by pixel. Yeah. And when you do the active learning part, the human in the loop part, yeah. do you ask the operator or the person to correct the bounding box or actually pixel by pixel? I was curious about that. Yeah, so some of them would just do because. You know, yeah. after they've seen like hundred images, they just get lazy and they're like, "Oh, we'll just draw a box mm -hmm. anywhere." We've seen, we've seen someone draw a box on a human being, assuming it's an insulator. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, <laughs> but uh, but we ask them to do like pixel by pixel, so polygon. Uh, okay. And how we type, they can make that. Uh, but if not, then we have our own labelers also. But oh. as long as we can get free work from them, I mean, as a business, it's it's much better for us. So. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned that the New York um, utility wants to go fully automated and digital by 2030, and like that was a, an aggressive timeline. I'm curious, like what that looks like beyond like this automated um, detection, like for like what else they need when they say that. Yeah, so um, they have multiple like vision or plans. So first is digital, become fully digital, and then they have oh, aggressive. What, what's what's become digital? So making all the processes 
uh, digitized. So they have a lot of like paper trail right now. So one example is this. So they'll go out in the field, write everything down on a notepad, bring them back, build another project report, which is again paper trail. Uh, so that's really inefficient because let's say five years down the line, they want to go back and see the inspection. They have to go through like tons of paperwork. Uh, so that's just not an efficient one. Another big one is drawings at substations. So they have to manually draw like circuit components and wires at every substation. That takes a lot of time. So they want to digitize that also and infuse computer vision in it. So it automatically uh, draws everything. So kind of like OCR, which is optical character recognition that you see in your like papers are all digitized now. So um, those kind of things. So that's on the digital side. And then they have both aggressive goals for uh, decarbonization also. So they want to electrify everything. Uh, so they are putting heavy emphasis on the hydro. Uh, so that's another goal. But on the digital side, uh, machine learning AI is a big portion of it because they want to automate a lot of digital processes. So digital is more mainly like software based. And then on top of that, they want to infuse machine learning AI into that. Um, so they have a lot of use cases for that one. So prime use case is ours, which is power line inspection. Uh, they have substation inspections, which are very manual and uh, very paper heavy. Then the other one is, so they have turbines underground that generate electricity. And whenever the turbine is damaged, uh, it generates a lot of steam. So you'll see in the city of New York, the steam is coming out of the manholes. And if it's a lot, then it actually means that there's something wrong happening beneath the, uh, under the road in the turbine. So early detection of that. So we're building a system for that also. So deploying on New city of New York cameras, deploying our AI system to detect heavy steam, uh, uh, exhaustion over there and then sending out an alert accordingly. So that's another use case. Cool. And then my last question is, um, so I, I don't know anything about this. I imagine when you're like selling to a utility, like if they have to get like software approved by the PUC or something, like, is it hard to like, like, are they willing to pay? Like, how, how does that work? Um, yeah. I mean, utilities, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinion, utilities are the hardest and the toughest customers who, to work with. Uh, takes forever to sell to them. Uh, just to give you context, a sales cycle for utilities 12 to 24 months uh, start to finish. So it takes forever because they are just heavily regulated. Uh, so they have to follow certain standards. They have to follow certain processes. So they need to, and these, these problems are uh, problems that impact society. Like we, this is not an app that someone uses. And if anything goes wrong, then you can just, you know, roll it back and then deploy it again. If anything goes wrong in a prediction, let's say we missed out a prediction of an insulator and that insulator falls down on dry you know, uh, branches and causes a fire, then we're on the hook for that. So these are, these are problems that are heavy uh, physics problems and heavy like engineering problems. So they take their time in terms of running a pilot program, run, running demonstrations, making sure everything's validated, everything is strong and uh, you know, uh, in place before they go out and fully deploy it at scale. And that is the effort that they, you know, they spend money on, uh, they spend their time on, and that's one of the reasons why the sales cycles are long. So yes, it takes time, but the, it should take time because these are impactful problems. Oh, thank you. Um, for the vegetation management problem, how often do you see utilities using LIDAR instead of uh, cameras? Yeah. And, and and second question, why do they still use helicopters as opposed to drones? Yeah, so there are a lot of utilities that have started using LiDAR. Um, LiDAR sensors have become really small, like the size of this, can fit on a drone easily. Uh, we are also starting to see a lot of LiDAR data come to us. So that's our next progression is building models for LiDAR, taking the 2D world and making it 3D, because uh, that's much more accurate in terms, especially for vegetation. Uh, so that's definitely in our product roadmap and we're building on it. So a lot of utilities are using LiDAR and that's the next uh, digital kind of uh, process. And then why the utilities, um, but also from two dimensional images, uh, we have a uh, kind of an algorithm that detects the depth of it, uh, which is not you know, very accurate as LiDAR, but it can detect the depth in the image. So let's say there's a pole over here, there's vegetation behind it. It can tell that it's behind it and it's not like overlapping on it. So those kind of things. Uh, so that's, that's on the 2D imagery. And then in terms of helicopters, a lot of utilities are decommissioning helicopters. New York Power Authority is one of the uh, ones that decommissioned all the helicopters last year, because uh, they had eight people die in like 2019 in a helicopter crash. 
and a huge line went down. So that was one of the reasons they had to decommission it. Uh, PG&E has had their fair share of helicopter crashes as well, uh, which is a big problem. So that's why a lot of utilities are adopting a lot more drone. Uh, most major utilities, investor-owned utilities, they have in-house drone programs now. They have drone pilots. They have a fleet of drones, uh, starting from DJI and now we're seeing Skydio drones. So it's a, uh, it's a fleet of drones they're buying. And the big portion of that, why it's uh, getting pushed, is drones are cheaper now. You can buy a drone for two hundred dollars with a really good camera on it. Uh, so that's one of the reasons. Is about the human in the workflow also to make sure. So with the like drones or helicopters take like some billions of images. Like do they do those AI programs get feedbacks actually from the human? Like also confused about what the like workflow was like from AI to human to AI or like. Yeah, it's kind of bi-directional. So bi -directional. So let's. So the first pass filter is AI. So think of it as a recommendation system, right? Mm -hmm. So it's giving you a suggestion. Hey, in this, you know, ten thousand images, there is like ten insulators that are damaged. So now the the person can go in and just look at ten images where those insulators are damaged and can review it if it's okay or it's not okay. And that feedback is then tracked from the human in the loop. And where it's wrong, it gets penalized. So that image goes back into the system. It's retrained on. And so it learns again from that image, from that feedback that the person provided. And then next time it sees that image, it recognizes the fault accurately. So, so it's like a bi-directional. It feeds back to the, to the human. So the human, so it feeds to the human, the human feeds it back, and then it feeds back to the human. So that's this kind of cycle. So just a quick question, like being not sure about like if this is in the level of your company, but like are you also thinking about like utilizing like satellite images? Yeah, we, we tried it. Um, satellite is an interesting one. So the open source satellite data, which is free, is not good. This is total BS. Because uh, a lot of times there's cloud cover, uh, and then you cannot penetrate that unless you have a technology called SAR, uh, which is expensive data. So for SAR sensors, it's just, you have to pay money. But in terms of resolution also, we're talking about, so we are even detecting uh, pins called quarter pins. So these all these electrical components are kept together by pins, right? So if those pins are missing, they will fall down. So we are even detecting if they're there or not, which is called quarter pins. So that's like this big. So satellite cannot detect that in that. Um, kind of like two questions. Um, I was first wondering like how you're doing the validation. Like, do you have, for example, like your model finds all these things that are off or um, like, anomalous and then somebody goes out into the field and sees what is actually out there and you compare like what you guys tagged versus the problems that actually exist so you guys don't miss problems and then secondly um maybe i have some confusion on the process but you talked about um the human in the loop and how linemen were wanted to be involved because they were afraid of losing their jobs but then you also said that your technology reduces the cost of a line from $250 an hour to $3 an hour. So when you're talking to a company that, um, I mean, I can imagine that politics and just not wanting to get a bad rep, like people don't want to lay off a bunch of, um, of their employees. Yeah. And, and I'm not like, I'm not saying pro or against or anything, but it was just something interesting that I was thinking about in terms of like a lot of companies are automating tasks nowadays. And, how do you sell it at a higher level as like, this is gonna reduce your overhead and then, but um, the employees are told that yeah. they're gonna be included somehow. Um, I'm just wondering about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I'll start with the, with the second question because that's uh, mm -hmm. holds much more weight. So in terms of the, the stakeholders that we're talking about CIOs and like uh, CXOs and VPs, if we bring a solution for, uh, to them that we say, hey, we'll save you $50 million every year, they don't really care if there's job cuts or not, because that's a different level. It's more about efficiency over there. But for, for our tool, it's actually a tool for linemen. So the, the real job of alignment is to do repair and replacement, go out. So you see the cherry picking trucks and they're doing repairing because mm -hmm. that's what they're uh, skilled for. That's mm -hmm. their, uh, their electrical engineers, their field technicians. Um, what now what they're doing is since there's so much data coming uh they are the ones that are going that are sitting in front of the computer for eight hours uh, a day seven, uh, five days a week 
and then sifting through the images, making sense out of it. So they don't really have time to go out in the field. So that uh, causes a lot of like delay. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to reprioritize their work, which is supposed to be their actual work. So we're taking away the looking at the screen uh, kind of thing and then making sense out of it. We're letting the software do that and then having them review it and then make and then take actions on it. So it's not like we are cutting the job. This is this was never their job to start off with uh, that they're supposed to do now, and that's causing delay. So in terms of just deployment and reprioritization of work, uh, that's a big one because linemen also want to be out in the field and do the job that they're supposed to do. So they're they're still getting paid that amount of money, but instead of spending time on this plus that with the delay of that, they just have to do the job that they're supposed to do. Basically. So if they're still getting paid that amount of money, how do you save the company so much money? If, like yeah. there would have to be, I'd imagine that there are linemen that are on the computer and then there are linemen that are in the, in the field. So you're cutting the linemen that are on the computer. Then. Yes, because from the start, they were not supposed to be on the computer. They were supposed to, their, their purpose is in the field due to maintenance, right? Mm -hmm. So now they're, Basically, the company is spending because there's delay in the maintenance now because they have to manually go through images. So the company that's a PGM is spending uh, fifty million dollars uh, every year just for the computer plus maintenance plus maintenance. Mm -hmm. While we are saying that you know we take away that computer cost and uh, make it more efficient, while the linemen can actually do their job. So instead of fifty million dollars, they're spending twenty five now. But to be clear, you are you are cutting linemen from the company, right? In, in the no, moment. no, yeah, we are we trying to say they, 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 could, they could do their job more efficiently. Instead of we have we have the line in ten okay. days, they in five days. Also, we ran so, out. We ran out of Yeah, yeah. So we are. So the linemen are still doing their job, which is out in the field. So imagine this: I'm a lineman. I have ten thousand images come back to me. Um, I'm spending, let's say, a week to go through them, and then the next seven days to go out in the field. So now I'm spending 14 days on a job, uh, which should have been seven days from the start. Like they should have just been out in the field doing maintenance. So we're taking that seven days, which they did not really want to do. Uh, and we're making it much more efficient, even though, I mean, they still are on the system. I mean, they're still interacting because this is a digital tool. Uh, so, so think of it like that. So if their jobs are not getting cut, they're just, doing the actual job they're supposed to do. So then is your like is your like maintenance, are they able to do more maintenance then? Like have you guys exactly. seen have exactly. you guys seen that there's like mm -hmm. have you done the analysis on like what the throughput is then? Yeah, and yeah. Then so uh, there is a huge backlog right now. Uh, so whenever we approach a utility and we see their work order system, there's a huge backlog of six months uh, on there. Uh, and then we're reducing that back backlog by half and even more. So linemen are already because again, they, if they don't know where to go, uh, they, they won't be able to go. So now they know where to go, what to look at. Uh, so it reduces their backlog and then it just makes their job more easier, basically. Does that, does that answer the question? I feel like you're still- of. I just wonder like how you're able to cut costs so much if people aren't getting cut. I, that was just like my main question. Because um, we're saving time and time has money uh, associated with that. So let's say, Mm -hmm. In order to do a job in so previously they were doing a job in 14 days. So they're just paying them for less time. Yeah. I have a question more on the business side of it. Uh, as you said, when you said that drones are cheap, I thought, yeah, drones are cheap and AI now, like anybody can just rent and give you in AWS and start building models. So uh, I just Google like what kind of competition you guys have. And there are many other initiatives, even Huawei now that's like inspection of power lines. So in the future or right now, what kind of like additional benefit or competitive advantage? How do you guys keep uh, plan to stay afloat? I'm curious. Yeah, so our our the, our models have the highest accuracy uh, right now as compared to the rest of the players, and this has been validated by our clients' utilities. So we are on an average our so that when we say accuracy, we say precision. Mm -hmm. So on an average, we are at ninety percent, and our closest competitor is at thirty five percent. And oh, wow. yeah, so we are way ahead. So that's one of the things. The other thing is we are using this technology for various other use cases, substation being a prime one. Uh, we are also now deploying this on uh, gas pipeline inspections mm -hmm. uh, for methane leakage, which is, which is a huge problem. So detect early detection of methane leakage 
before it becomes a huge uh, and and that also relates to climate uh, again carbon emissions so trying to resolve that as well and so yeah so we're taking this and applying it to different use cases and that's one of the things about our models uh, our ai is it's just really flexible uh, to just get retrained really fast uh, recalibrated really fast for different use cases as long as it's in energy infrastructure space so that's another one and then the last one is we're solving a prioritization problem, uh, which is workflow prioritization, which is one of the things we, talk, uh, we talked about, which is for linemen to be easily able to save a lot of, make their more operations more efficient, uh, which a lot of companies or competitors don't, are not solving. So we, we're using machine learning for that as well. Oh, there's two questions here. Um, how reliable are the cameras to we uh, weather issues or bird dropping? So, <laughs> These cameras are really uh, powerful. Uh, now, the, the ones that utilities are using, high zoom, high res the resolution, we have even seen cameras, 100 megapixel cameras, uh, just zoom in on really uh, you know, small targets, uh, especially the ones that are deployed on drones. So in terms of weather, we, we, weather is a big factor. So we, we get data and we have made our data set variable like that. And that's another competitive advantage is we don't only have data that is in like bright sunlight or sunny day, it's actually we have had data come where there's snow in the background, where it's rainy, where there's uh, you know a storm had just happened and everything's like destroyed in its path. So we've had all kinds of we have had, we've had data at nighttime. So our AI is is calibrated to deal with different you know environments accordingly. And one of the things that we have put in place is uh, is this uh, is this thing called single shot learning, which is learning from a small uh, volume of objects uh, so as you know uh, there are more healthy components out in the field as compared to damaged right so so we had to balance that out so we developed certain algorithms to focus on it, especially the components and uh, uh, kind of look away from the noise which is the background environment now we are, what we are doing is since we have a good enough data set we are generating our own data which is called synthetic data generation so we are using uh, generative adversarial networks for that which is another topic uh, but we are generating data from data. And in that data, we can simulate different conditions. So we can simulate different environments. We can put in much more noise into the data. So the, the models are much more variable, much more robust in its, uh, uh, in its functioning. And any studies on different locations? Yes, uh, as I said, we have had you know, location from in the Midwest, we've had data which has you know, snow in the background. We've had uh, data that has you know, rain and all those kind of things. Is there any talk, have you heard talks about um, uh, utilities looking for ignition uh, prediction for wildfires, like vegetation ignition prediction? I've seen some papers that have Berkeley on like predicting when. I yeah. imagine you could do that with your data. Yeah, yeah. So that's something that uh, utilities have actually asked us, and that's more like looking at metrics. Like one of the one of them is NDVI. So looking at the vegetation index uh, of, of uh, and the moisture content in the vegetation and then predicting, okay, uh, when can we expect this vegetation to become combustible basically? Uh, so that's one of the things that we are looking at. So there's uh, on the vegetation side. So we're using thermal infrared cameras on drones to look at vegetation and then uh, calculate the NDVI indices uh, for that, then correlate that to the actual you know, dryness uh, coefficient. Uh, so that's something that yeah, we're looking at. There's one more question. Yeah, there's one more question. Do you have access to non-image data, those predictive pending faults? Yes. So uh, we are starting to get a lot of non-visual data as well. As you know, the, a lot of the problems that happen uh, outside, so it's it's kind of correlated. What whatever happened outside of, of the line is also related to what's happening inside and vice versa. So let's say there's heavy load, let's say in California, in Palo Alto, there's 100 EVs getting charged at the same time, there's a lot of load put on the transformer, nearest transformer, and it might blow up. So looking at those conditions as well is uh, fluctuations in load as we see more renewable assets come online, more EVs, uh, EV charging stations come online. So kind of mapping that, monitoring that as well. Uh, again, the, the grid is, is kind of the backbone of everything basically. So as more uh, you know uncertain things are getting added to it, and a lot of climate change effects are happening as well. We're starting to collect more data on the non-visual side, which is line data, AMI data, uh, load, uh, load voltage fluctuation data, 
uh, environmental data, so temperature, humidity, and then mapping that with, with the visual data itself, and then building predictive models. So we're starting to do that since we're getting much more historical data. It will take some time, uh, I would say two, three years to build accurate predictive models, but that's where we want to go. So we can tell, okay, this asset can blow up before it actually blows up, and that's end game, end, end game scenario to kind of simulate the environment. So take the physical reality and bring it to digital, and then simulate different scenarios in digital, is, is that's the vision. I'm curious about the cameras mounted in the drones. At first, I thought it was just an RGB, but if you can get NDVI, then you have near infrared. And I think you also mentioned thermal. So what, how many channels or how does it work? Yeah, there's uh, our drone partners, they're using uh, multi-channel, multi-spectral cameras, actually. Oh. So they're using RGB, they're using uh, thermal, they're using infrared. Uh, companies like Zen News and uh, all these companies have multi-spectral cameras now. Uh, they're also using LiDAR at the same time. So not only multi-spectral, but also going in the LiDAR space. Oh, on each drone, you have all those capabilities. Mm -hmm. oh. and, and these drones are massive. Like These are industrial size drones like this big. So, oh, yeah. Gotcha. Any more questions? Awesome. Um, so you mentioned like the appeal to a utility is that like it saves money and also it prevents like bad things from happening that they can get in trouble for. Um, if a like utility like gets paid their like rate of return, like given to them by spending more money, they probably won't want to save costs, right? So maybe like how do they think about that? Like, do they care about just like like, how do you tell them? So the incentive, I mean, utilities are an interesting, they're an interesting organization. So one of the things about utilities is if it's costing them something too much, they'll just uh, hike up the price of the way payers, us, and we won't even notice. And that's how they make it up. But that's changing now. A lot of utilities are uh, kind of deploying and adopting emerging technologies that can actually make their process is more efficient like us. And then there's a lot more companies that are helping utilities. And what that does is that now utilities have to meet their uh, uh, ESG goals. They have to meet their carbon emission goals and those kind of things. So the money they save, they invest in the innovative technologies. So they have their innovation arm. So pg &E has an innovation arm, uh, SoCal Edison, all these major utilities. And they the amount of money they're saving, they're implementing in research and innovation technologies that can help them become decarbonized as soon as possible. What, what are like the big carbon emissions from like the utility? Like I guess other- Natural gas generation. Oh, so generators are included in like this transmission thing? I thought they were separate. Yeah, so there's generation where the electricity is produced and that's where, you know, your coal plants, your natural gas, those kind of, now renewables are in the mix too. And then once the electricity is produced, it goes downhill, you have to transfer that. So that's where high voltage transmission uh, comes in, so 230, 250,000 volts goes to a substation. It turns it down using transformers. Uh, but they're the same company, the the transmission line and the generator. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So I guess I'm I'm just trying to understand. It like, can be. Yeah. Is so, there a way for the like a transmission line? Aren't they already? Do they emit a lot of carbon? They they have a footprint a footprint of carbon. I mean, they are you know transmitting electricity that is needed by us. And that electricity is produced at a, at a generation facility, uh, which could be owned by utilities. So PG&E, uh, for example, New York Power Authority, they produce their own electricity. So they, they have a lot of hydropower uh, uh, generation facilities. So they, they generate electricity. And a lot of times, uh, their plants are also natural gas based, and that has a footprint on it. So even if the utility doesn't own the generation facility in cases, and they only own like the distribution, uh, they still indirectly are, you know, they're, they're still consumers of that electricity and then they have their own goals as well. Cool, thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your interesting talk.